Hey world, welcome to Tech Deck Deck Tech. I am Dan Brown and today we're talking about Crufix. <laughs> Green is the best color for ramping you into a late game board state relatively early, and blue, aside from being just like good at everything, um, is particularly good at providing you with constant card advantage. So I've chosen Krufix as my Simic commander because he amplifies, he plays to what are already the color combination's greatest strengths. Here it says you have no maximum hand size, and if unused mana would empty from your mana pool, instead it becomes colorless. That last ability allows Krufix to play a very strong draw-go style game where our turns are very short generally. We untap, draw, pass turn, and our opponents are scared to do anything too dynamic for fear that we might counter it, and if we don't wind up countering anything, then we simply bank the mana and have that mana to spend on our turn on, you know, some huge spell. As for Krufix's first two abilities, Indestructible is just obviously good because it makes your commander that much harder to deal with, and as long as your devotion to green and blue is less than seven, he's not a creature, that's a feature, not a bug. Nine times out of ten, you don't want Krufix to be a creature because being a creature makes him that much easier to deal with, right? Swords to Plowshares, Path to Exile. Even though this is a highly competitive deck, it does have a theme, and that is the Path of non-violence. We never attack. We prefer counter spells to destroy effects, right? They're the abortion of magic. Or when we do have to destroy something from a flavor perspective, we're not actually killing it. We're simply, you know, casting Beast Within, turning your creature into a less threatening creature, right? Let's draw our opening hand. We have one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven. Okay, I mean, okay. I don't like to keep much of anything that won't have an effect in the early game, so I think that we're gonna keep Forest, Forest, and Pitch Five for our uh, free mulligan. One, two, three, four, five. Again, not perfect. I think we wanna mold down here. I'm gonna keep these three and pitch these four to draw three. So let's find out what we get. One, two, Three. I like that so much better. We have land drops for four turns, a metamorph for some utility, and a Jace's ingenuity to refill our hand. Ideally, we'd have more ramp and maybe a counter spell, but this will work. We're gonna draw. We got an arcane denial. Perfect. And then we're gonna play a snow covered island. Move on to turn two. We're going to draw. Oh, a prophet of Krufix. This is getting better by the minute. We're going to drop a snow covered forest and pass turn. Turn three, we will draw a Peregrine Drake. Interesting. In a perfect world, an opponent would have ramped into a Gilded Lotus at this point or something, but uh, I think the best we can do is assume that there's a Soul Ring out, so let's play a Reflecting Pool. We'll pay a Phyrexian Mana. Can we say that? Let's say it's a Soul Ring. Turn four, untap up, keep draw. We get a Glenelandra. Okay, now we have some options. We're definitely going to play a Forest for turn, but we can either cast Crufix, Prophet of Crufix, Glenelandra, or Jace's Ingenuity holding up an Arcane Denial. I think this turn we take a more conservative approach so that we can guarantee that Prophet will stick uh, during the next turn cycle. So this turn with a Soaring, three, four, like that, um, we'll cast Glenelandra and pass turn, leaving up mana either to activate Glenelandra or for an Arcane Denial. Let's move on to a turn, where is it? Five here, untap upkeep, we will draw our, an, an actual soul ring, that's always a good card. I think all we do is tap a forest to cast an actual soul ring, and then we pass turn holding up an arcane denial, but it, hopefully we don't have to use it and instead we can cast Jace's Ingenuity to draw three cards. Let's assume that we do. So one, two, three, four, five, this is during our opponent's end step, and hopefully in the three cards we draw we'll hit a land to... Uh, didn't, so all right, this is all right. This is turn six. We're hoping to top deck a land here. Untap, upkeep, and not a land. Okay. You know, I do see one potentially interesting line of play, and that would involve worldly tutoring for Deadeye Navigator, casting Peregrine Drake, untapping our lands, and then casting Deadeye Navigator to go for the infinite combo, and we can then stroke ourselves for, you know, infinite cards, infinite mana, win the game. Um, I think we are going to go for that, but first, this turn, turn six, um, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, awkwardly wasting a colorless mana, but that's okay. Um, drop a Krufix. Oh, we don't, we won't waste it, we'll bank it. What am I talking about? We pass turn, and at this point of the game, this turn cycle, it will probably be in our best interest to actually cast our Arcane Denial, counter something, I don't know what. Um, and at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep, we will draw a card, and that opponent that we countered um, will draw two cards. We got an evacuation there. Um, and then end of turn, we'll bank one mana from the snow-covered forest. This will be turn seven. We will draw for turn. We got a right of replication. Need to think. Lots of options, not enough lands. 
I think we're finally ready to cast Prophet of Crufix, although it's turned into more of a lark than anything. We're hoping to fish out answers from opponents. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. That's how we'll tap for it. Um, so that we can actually worldly tutor into our Deadeye Navigator to combo off with the Paragon Drake uh, without our opponents having answers in hand. I mean, it's still in our best interest to try and protect Prophet, so when they try to Swords her at end of turn, we'll pop Glenalandra, persist trigger on the stack, another opponent will cast the you know, Path to Exile, and we'll say that one actually works. Or let's say Swords, just so they don't have to tutor for another land. Um, Glen will come back, Prophet is permanently exiled, and I think we win regardless. At the end of our opponent's turns, first of all, we'll bank two mana from Sol Ring here, and then with a green, we will cast Worldly Tutor, and we're going to fetch up Deadeye Navigator. Found Deadeye, shuffle, put it on top. We will untap, upkeep, uh, we will draw our Deadeye Navigator, put that in our hand. We will then tap one, two, three, four, where is it? There it is. Uh, Five. We will cast a Peregrine Drake. Our opponents will see what's coming since they knew I tutored for Deadeye Navigator. They'll try to do something about that, but we'll counter it with Glenalandra, who is gone forever now. Peregrine Drake trigger on the stack. I will float two more mana here. Uh, then we'll untap up to five lands. We only have four of them, but that should be good enough, except for the fact that I neglected to consider how much blue we have. We're one mana short. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If we had nine, we could cast Rite of Replication Kicked, targeting Peregrine Drake, giving us more than enough mana with the untap triggers to get the Dead Eye combo started. But in this situation, knowing that we messed up, I think that we just pass turn and try to protect Peregrine Drake with Dream Fracture. During opponent's turns, let's say, you know, one, two, three, we do have to cast Dream Fracture. Uh, we'll both draw a card. Not a land. Where are my lands? And let's be generous and say that the opponents run out of answers and can't deal with this and we can float three mana. Five. I just want to show you what it looks like. We untap, upkeep. We draw, okay, a Temple of Mystery is better than nothing. We will scry one. It is a land, but not the color we need. We'll put it on the bottom, because who cares? At this point, we'll use the five mana here, six, seven, blue, blue. We will cast a Rite of Replication Kicked, targeting Peregrine Drake. We'll get five copies of that and five triggers on the stack to untap up to five lands. So that's gonna net us, what's that, 25 mana, uh, something like? We're gonna have more than enough mana to cast Deadeye Navigator with Counterspell Backup and Flicker for Infinite Mana to stroke ourselves for this much of our library to cast a Helix Pinnacle, put 100 counters of it on it, and Time Stretch for the win without having to even look through the rest of our hand. Pact of Negation back up. First up, we have Prophet of Crufix and her older sister, Seedborn Muse. I mean, in any deck that's built around banking mana, obviously we want to untap everything we have during all of our opponent's turns. I know that this card is a point of consternation for many commander players, but in this deck, yes, it's incredibly strong, but we don't use it in the most infuriating way. If there's an argument for banning Prophet of Crufix, it's because it slows down the pace of the game, right? Who needs time walk effects when every turn is your turn, when you're flashing in creatures on all of your opponent's end steps, but that's not what we're doing in Crufix. In Crufix, we're simply banking the mana and allowing the game to proceed, so it doesn't slow down the game much at all. That said, she is still far and away the most powerful card in the deck, MVP Forger. Okay, next up, uh, let's just go through our basic lands. This one's a normal island, the rest are snow-covered islands. We'll get to why in a little bit here. Uh, same thing with forest. One normal forest and the rest are snow-covered. As for non-basic lands, uh, the first one we have is Myriad Landscape. It's a land that ramps from the new commander sets. It's fantastic. Run it in as many decks as is reasonable. Um, if you've seen my tech deck, deck tech for Chromat, you know how much I love the Ravnica Karoos. This is the Simic version of that. Um, there is one way in the deck to untap it. That's the first reason it's good. But more generally, if your opening hand only has two lands in it, but one of them is this, you still effectively have three land drops. It's, it's just really good in a dirtily format. Fun fact, fetch lands have no color identity because even though this looks white, it doesn't actually have a white mana symbol. So you can run it in any deck. And we just just use this um, to fetch up our breeding pool if we don't have it already, otherwise just, you know, an island. Temple of Mystery, early game scry is fantastic, Command Tower is good, it's a good card, and okay, Alchemist's Refuge. It gives things flash, what more do you want? I mean, if we already have a butt ton of mana, the three mana effectively it costs to activate it, right, because you have to tap it too. Um, it's, that's nothing. All told, that's 35 lands, which is admittedly pretty light, that's as light as I'll ever go in a commander deck, but we make up for that, not with a Pact of Negation, we make up for that with a bunch of ramp, I mean, 
Soul Ring auto include. We have a bunch of one mana mana dorks. Lanowar Elephant, the first German printing of Lanowar Elf. Turds is good. Cura's Follower, this is the card we were talking about that allows us to untap the Simic Growth Chamber for extra value. You'll notice that all of my ramp spells uh, come out on turn three or sooner because the early game in Crufix is all about casting Crufix. It's part of the optimization process. I wound up cutting, you know, four mana ramp effects like, say, Sky Shroud Claim just because that doesn't help us get Crufix out on turn, you know, three. And then, of course, a somewhat obscure card that is an auto include in Crufix is Doubling Cube. Double the amount of each type of mana in your mana pool. If you have 30 mana floating in Crufix, for three mana, you can turn that into 60. What? And if you have a Seedborn Muse, you can do it on each of your opponent's turns, too. So that's our ramp to ramp into more ramp so that we can play a Drago-style game. Wow, that's kind of cool. <laughs> and Drago is at its most effective when your opponents are scared that you might use all that untapped mana. You have to counter their spells. So here's our suite of counter spells. Pact of Negation is good. Trickbind is... Uh, it's good. They're, they're all good. Okay, this... All right, this card... Okay, this card. Urtai's Meddling has been eroded a few times. It doesn't, strictly speaking, counter a spell. It exiles a spell for a few turns. So you can use it against uncounterable spells, you know, things cast with Boseju. What's more is that if you're using Urtai's Meddling to exile a spell that targets, when that spell tries to resolve again in X turns, the targets remain intact. So if that target is no longer valid, you can just have X as one and the, the, the spell will be countered regardless. Can't go wrong with the original. Uh, here we have Forbid, which is wonderful if you have more than like 20 cards in your hand, which Crufix allows you to do. Sometimes even the graveyard is not a safe place for a card to be. Any counter spell that replaces itself is good, and that it draws your opponent a card isn't that much of a drawback, especially in a multiplayer format. Void Slime counters triggered or activated abilities on top of spells, very good. Glenelandra is basically two counter spells in one, or two negates, I should say, and her ability can't be countered unless your opponents are using like Trickbind or Stifle. Dismisses like a Dream Fracture without the drawback, and finally, oh ah, yes, Desertion. This card can just outright win games. Why hate on the new Tuck rule when you can just steal a problem commander on cast? Next up, uh, we have the card advantage part of the equation, and in an older version of this deck, uh, I favored huge card draw spells, things that cost a lot of mana and got you a ton of cards, but I realized that was a little bit more of a glass cannon. Opponents were more scared of that, not to mention that you couldn't fire off quite as early in the game. So in, in the current build, um, I favor a slightly smaller, you know, Fichter Faction action, we got Opportunity, Jace's Ingenuity, you know, things that cost four or five mana, uh, Mold Drifter, okay, and then we do still have a few super bombastic spells. These three have the ability to just gush cards into your hand. Just make sure you hold up a counter spell. If you got 13 mana available, don't stroke yourself for 10, stroke yourself for 7, okay? Getting into our answers section, there's nothing you probably haven't seen before, but Cyclonic Rift is just an auto-include in any blue deck seriously at run it. Beast Within, this is what we are talking about earlier. We're not destroying your creature, we're turning it into a beast, right? Uh, Capsize is not only an answer, but a potential combo piece. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and Aether Spouts and Evacuation are basically less good, but almost as good Cyclonic Rifts. Also in the answers section, but sticking a little bit more true to our theme of non-violence, uh, we have Fog Effects. If you've never seen Constant Mists before, this card is a house. There are some decks that have no answer to it and just can't win if you have this in your hand. Also, um, we have Sunstone, which is a very similar effect. It's an artifact for three, and you can pay two to sacrifice a snow-covered land and prevent all combat damage this turn. This is the reason that we run almost exclusively snow-covered basic. Finally, uh, we have Glacial Chasm, which is a land, but I didn't include it in the land section because functionally we don't use it like a land. It doesn't produce mana, right? It has cumulative upkeep to life. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice a land. You cannot attack, which is not a problem because we're non-violent anyway, and all damage dealt to you is reduced to zero. Just like the other fog effects, this is designed to buy us precious turns, and after a while the cumulative upkeep does add up, but fun synergy, we can capsize it, return it to our hand, and reset the cumulative upkeep if it starts getting a little too hefty. Next up, we have some utility slash tutor cards. Um, Sensei's Divining Top, not a tutor, but I don't really know where else to put it. It's one of those cards that makes almost any EDH deck strictly better. I run an almost tournament legal mystical tutor, a perfectly tournament legal worldly tutor, a court of calling, which allows us to put our profit of Krufix directly 
directly into play from our library. A birthing pod, which is too good for modern, but perfectly good for EDH. We can get all sorts of value, utility out of this. Um, and a ring of three wishes, which allows us to tutor up three things, which should be uh, good enough to win the game. And Lord knows we have plenty of colorless mana to boot. I have a few uh, utility creatures that don't quite fit in with any other section. Gilded Drake for two mana comes into play. We switch it with any creature an opponent controls. Just, I mean, take the best thing on the board in exchange you get a 3-3 flyer, pretty strong. Um, Phyrexian Metamorph is just a clone for an artifact or a creature. Clever Impersonator is a clone for anything other than a land. And Teferi is usually step one of locking down the board and winning the game. He prevents our opponents from doing anything faster than sorcery speed. So once we have a Teferi in play, or just have enough mana and counter spells to back up whatever we want to do, we do have some enormous spells to pour all of that juicy Krufix mana into. Right of Replication can be five Gilded Drakes. It can be five Eternal Witnesses, five Mole Drifters. It can be five of anything your opponents have cast. Like, there is rarely a board state where there's not a good target to make five clones of. And don't forget, kids, in a pinch, you can cast this for four. It's just a slightly worse clone. Like, not bad by any stretch. Boundless Realms is the ramp spell to end all ramp spells. I don't think I've ever successfully cast this and not gone on to win the game. It is that strong. Once you have all the mana in the world, banking it into even more of all of the mana in the world, you, just, you can do anything. Including, but not limited to, Tooth and nail, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, to grab this infinite combo right here. Or if someone has dealt with one of these pieces somehow, you know, you, you've seen all the utility creatures we have, you can still uh, present a pretty convincing board lock with this. This untaps five lands when it enters the battlefield. This blinks a creature for two mana. You're effectively netting three mana every time you blink this guy, so infinite mana. Or if you want a slightly slower way of generating just as much infinite mana, uh, step one is time stretch, which is a huge effect in and of itself. For 10 mana, target player takes two extra turns. Now, contemporary time walk effects always have an added clause that they exile themselves, but this one, a little bit older, it doesn't have that, so we take advantage. We can recur it with things like Eternal Witness, or Archaeomancer, or Mnemonic Wall. If we cast Time Stretch, have any of these three, and then say a Dead Eye Navigator to blink them, or a Capsize to buy them back and recast them, you can take infinite turns. And then to finish off non-violently, we have Laboratory Maniac and or Helix Pinnacle as our win conditions. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. There's more content to the side. You can watch uh, Tech 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 for my Chromat combo deck or my explanation of how that Chromat combo deck took down the competitive commander tournament at uh, Gen Con this year in Indianapolis. <laughs>